Amen. Now that's something to look forward to when uh, we say goodbye to this place and say hello to the next. What a great and wonderful day that's going to be. If you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to Joshua chapter 3. Uh, Joshua chapter 3. And while you're turning over that way, I will remind you to uh, remember our missionaries when you think to pray for them. Uh, certainly something that we always need to keep at our forefront. Uh, Joshua chapter 3 in verse 5. The, the Bible says, And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake unto the priests, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant, and pass over before the people. And they took up the ark of the covenant, and went before the people. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that, I, that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words, and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out before you the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Gergeshites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over before you into Jordan. Now therefore, take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe a man, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of their feet, as the soles of the feet of the priest that bar, bear the ark of the Lord, and the Lord and all of the, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon a heap. And it came to pass, when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as they that bear the Ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the water, for Jordan overfloweth his banks all the time of harvest, and the waters which came down from above stood and rose up, <coughs> excuse me, upon a heap very far from the city Adam, that is Zaratan, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were placed clean over Jordan. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word this morning. God, we praise you how it speaks to our hearts from time to time and leads us in a very weary land and in a dry day. God, come down and uh, meet with us and fill your temple here as you did in days of old. Speak to every heart and cause us to rejoice and say it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, we're going to be looking at the crossing of Jordan, and, and more important than crossing Jordan is what happened afterwards. Now, I've heard Jordan, the crossing of Jordan and the crossing of the Red Sea often refer to death. I do not believe it refers to a physical death at all. I be believe if it refers to anything, it's the new birth and what happens after the new birth. Now, two things, just like in the new birth today, uh, two things can happen.
happen after you're saved, you can serve him or you cannot. Now, in the modern day, if they're really saved, and I doubt that seriously sometimes, very few people set their self to serve God. Uh, they think salvation, that they deserve it. <laughs> and you know what? If you think you deserve something or you've asked for something, you're not going to value it very much. But if somebody comes along and just hands you a gift, it's going to be important to you. Uh, you've done nothing to receive it. You didn't ask for it. You didn't do nothing. Uh, it's just given to you. And we'll see that uh, hopefully from the Word of God. Going back to first verse 5, and they're preparing to make this crossing and, and do this thing to serve the Lord. The Bible says, And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves. Now, I ask you this, is that still a modern day thing? And I'll have to say that it is. The New Testament says, Sanctify thyself. Uh, that, that simply means get yourself ready for service. Now, I, I dare say that the bulk majority of Christians never sanctify themselves because it's too akin to Pentecostal doctrine and we're afraid to say things like sanctified and set apart and useful for the Lord's Word, but that's exactly what it is. We, if you want to be used of the Lord, you first have to sanctify yourself. And you can't save yourself, but you can sanctify yourself. You say, well, Brother Larry, how do I get that done? Well, get in the Word of God. That's the first thing. You read it, and you read it, and you reread it. You get yourself under some sound preaching and teaching of the Word of God, and you do it every time you have an opportunity, and just suck it up the best of what can. That's sanctifying. Now, the next step, it's the hard one on the flesh, is obedience. Right, right. You got to know the Word of God, and then you got to do what the Word of God says. And so that's what Joshua was saying to his people: Sanctify yourself. We're fixing to do great things for the Lord. Sanctify yourself. Set yourself apart. Make yourself ready for what we're about to do. Sanctify is a mouthful in and of itself. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. You know, what, what a wonderful thing that we, if we could believe that, if I stood before you one day and said, Church, sanctify yourself, because tomorrow the Lord is going to do great things uh, among you. And you say, well, Larry's lost his mind. No, no. Uh, the confidence is in believing God Amen. and sanctifying yourself. It's truly setting yourself apart. And that doesn't come easy. You, you, you remember the church there at Antioch, the Bible says that they were ministering and fasting and then the Lord spoke. See, that there's preparatory work if you want to hear from God. And, and, and you know, you hear devil, God ain't do nothing. God don't move among us. Listen, he's not changed. We have. And if we don't do the prep work, we ain't going to get the results. You ever take a test when you were in school? And you know what? I guarantee you this. If you didn't study, you didn't do too well because you didn't do the prep work. And if you did and you study and you reread some of the stuff that crazy teacher said, then you probably did much better because you did the prep work. And we live in the church age section where there's no prep work getting done. None whatsoever. And so we see that Joshua recommended that to them. Verse 6, And Joshua spake unto the people, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and pass over before the people, and they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Now, I want you to see there's a command and then some obedience to follow. You know what? I think that he was just testing them out, seeing if they were going to listen, seeing if they were going to do just what he had told them to do. I want you to be obedient. I want you to sanctify yourself and get ready. And the next thing he said is pick up the Ark. 
and they picked it up, got it in place. If you know how the staves went through the hooks, and then you picked it up by the staves, you didn't touch the ark, and then they had a, a hoop on them that rested on their shoulders. Uh, it took four men to carry it. And they said, get, they said, take it up, and they took it up. Now, when the Lord says something to you, do you do it? Now, you know, taking up the ark, relatively, relatively easy, uh, they had to respect the ark. They, they couldn't touch the box itself. They had to touch it by the staves. And, uh, but generally it was easy. There wasn't a lot in that ark. It, it was a golden box, a uh, uh, wooden box laid over with gold, and inside you had the stones which the Ten Commandments were written, Abram's rod that budded, and uh, a bowl of money. Well, it wasn't really a heavy box, but so it wasn't the work, it was the obedience. And, and what I believe in the modern day is true now. Listen, when he first starts with you, he's not going to tell you to go to the moon and preach the gospel. He, all it may be is open your Bible and read the 23rd Psalms, but you'll be, you be obedient in that and he'll give you something more to do. So all the instruction was, was pick up the ark. You get the ark in place. You get the first thing first. And certainly that's what we should do. You know what? I see a lot of young preachers today, they don't want to put first things first. They want to pastor a church of about 200 people uh, right out of the gate. The Bible says very easily, not, not a novice. You know, you know what they need to do? They need to get in that book and bury themselves in this book and immerse themselves in Scripture, and then they'll be ready to pastor. And, and they'll get in one of those little 12-member churches where you have to work more outside the church than you do inside to feed your, your wife and the children. And you know, you know, the older I get, the more I see, man, that's good for them. <laughs> that's good for them. You know what? If they have a church like that, they'll value their ministry. They really will. And, and, and so we find then, as Joshua gives them a very simple commandment, what, what you find is obedience. Verse 7. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they, know, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. And so they got a commandment and some instruction, and then Joshua got some commandments and instructions. Now, what happened to Moses? We, he went up on the mount, looked over into the Holy Land, and the Bible says that the Lord buried him. So we know he died up on that mountain. And you know what? Don't you think sometimes their faith got a little wavery? And maybe some of the women sitting around and sewing the quilt said, I just wonder what happened to Moses. Mm. You, know, you know that had to be. Because you know what? It's this flesh's nature to doubt, to, to wonder, to question what God has said. It's our, it's our nature. And, and so we find that uh, this may have been good news or bad news for little Joshua because you know what? He's like, hmm, you know what? I don't even know where Moses is anymore, and he's going to magnify me like he did him. You know, that may be a good thing, and it may be a not-so-good thing. So he says, I'm going to magnify thee starting today. Verse 8, And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, when you are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. So he's going to, he, he says, I'm going to magnify you. This is your next set of instructions. You tell them priests to walk out in Jordan and just be still. You, you know what the hardest thing you will ever do is one of God's children be still. 
Because it's the nature of this flesh to do, 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 do. Now, this next generation, I don't know so much about that. I think their uh, motivation is set, 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 set. <laughs> but they're still not doing anything. You know, you know what I'm saying? And to stand still and wait for the move of God is the hardest thing you will ever do. But yet and still that was their instruction. You know, as we talked about sanctification and preparing ourselves, that sounds good, do not it? I don't know. And when I try to sanctify myself, I try to immerse myself in the Word of God and try to make time for fasting and prayer and get some time by myself before the Lord. And you know what? That's all activity. It's stuff you can do. But when he says, Jared, stand still, that's a horse of a different color, ain't it? I don't want you to do nothing. Doing nothing will be one of the hardest things you ever do. Because it's not in man's nature to do so. So these priests, via Joshua, were told to stand still down in the river. They were to be, they were to be still as they did this. In verse 9. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither, and hear the words of the Lord. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, that he, shall, uh, that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the, Gerges and the Gergesites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. So I want you to see that as he's preaching to his people, he gives them a real broad picture. When we get over Jordan, I promise you this, the nations are going to fall before us. You know, that, 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 that would have been hard to believe, wouldn't it? Because it had been 40 years, but see, they, they remember that, that sad report that 10 of the witnesses brought back from the other side before. There's giants in the land. There's, there's no way we can do this. You know, stuff like that will last more than 40 years, but God is good won't last 40 minutes. You see what I'm saying? So those things had bled through generation by generation and, and probably was still very much of a hindrance, but these people, primed and ready, sanctified, you know what? They believed what Joshua said and they believed God. Now, these five nations that they would kill, most of them, was a, uh, was a strong bunch indeed. You know what? Sin is strong. Sin will get a hold of you, and it will take you down. Remember, they let that one little tribe live, I think, uh, maybe Jared or Adam, Adam, I think it was, was teaching on them, and they pretended like they were pitiful people, and they became servants. See, that wasn't God's plan, was it? God's plan seemed harsh, and you know what? It usually does. That's what this big group hug, God is love, it's not with the Bible. And he, he, he said, take them out. So see, they had violated the plan of God, and you see how that went. And, and, and so we find then uh, what we need to do is simply be obedient. But at this stage in their travels, they were serving God just like they ought to be. Verse 10, excuse me, verse 11. And behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over, passeth over before you unto Jordan. Now, uh, in that day, the Ark of the Covenant was a type unto uh, uh, the person of God. It's what they identified the presence of God with. And, and he says, listen, the presence of God is going to go over Jordan before you, and you're going to follow. See, you want the power of God, you've got to follow. You're not the leader. You're not the one in charge. Your, your life is not your own. The Bible says, Paul said you're bought with a price. And, and, and so the only thing we have to offer really is obedience. 
And obedience is very, very difficult sometimes, even uh, it, the most when life is at risk. You say, well, if God loved me, he wouldn't uh, put my life at risk. Well, you don't know the Bible very well. Uh, talk to the 12 apostles and say that again, or they love. And, and, and so we find then that uh, what was wanted from God's people was simple, faithful obedience. We talk, you know, we talk of faithful often is like me being faithful to Donna. But faithful really means this, full of faith. And you know what? Most of the time we're not. If we were full of faith, we'd act like it. And when there was a request, we'd get her done. Why? Because we were full of faith. And we had an interest. And we had an obedience about us. And the Lord would bless that in a very, very wonderful way. So he says, uh, uh, let the ark go before you. Verse 13. And it come to pass, as soon as, the, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest the water shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and thou shalt stand upon a heap. Now, I really, never really noticed this, but I, I understand it better than I ever have reading this. He did not split the waters of Jordan like he did the Red Sea. Uh, the creek at Carlisle, Cross Creek, runs from south to north and empties into the, to the river or the lake right there at Bear Springs. And whatever way the river run there at Jordan, it began to stack up. Nothing moved this way, almost like an invisible dam. And all this ran off, and it was dry ground under it. And this kept building up and building up and building up. And they were as safe as they could be. Now, let me tell you something you may or may not know. The, the creek at Carlisle gets in flood real, real easy. Now, uh, it kind of tickles me a little bit because every time there's a bad flood, they go, oh, it ain't that bad, that's just a 100-year flood. And then another one goes, oh, that's the 500-year flood. And I want to say, now, how do you know we weren't here 500 years ago? And, but anyway, you know, there's always an excuse to be made. Well, the last one that came, and it's been about nine years ago now, was the 500-year flood. And if you know much about Carlo, as you're going down toward Erin, the creek is really far on your left, and the further you get up the, or down the road in Carlo, the more the creek is over that way. Well, in the little store in Carlo, I'd say it's probably at least 500 feet from the store. You know where that little store is. The last time the 500-year flood came, it was this deep in the store. And uh, see, that's why water piling up. You don't think God can do it? And this was the weird thing. I mean, you know, Carl can be a slum now. It was fine at Bear Springs. See, he does what he wants to with water. He, he's the author of it. He, he does all things well. Now, with that said, how about waiting in that? How, how about getting out in Cross Creeks at Carlisle with the store underwater and you're going to just take a little walk down through Carlisle? For the priest, that was the request, wasn't it? But see, in a few verses down, it tells us it's in the blood. It's rushing. It'll take you over. I remember... Uh, uh, my mama telling me this, and I don't know what flood the scientists call this, but she was three, so that would have been in about 1939 or 1940. My great grandmother had a house set down in the low spot close to the bank of the creek, and it was so bad that the lower story of the house was underwater, and water was starting to creep up in the upper story. And uh, my great-grandmother and her husband, she married again after my great-grandfather died, 
were hanging out of the upstairs window talking to Papa and, and Mama. And they were looking across the bank at them, and they were up there talking to him. And if you look at that place today, you couldn't believe that that much water would even fit into there to come into the floor of a second-story house. But see, God does what he will with water. You, if he can, you know, I, it never ceases to amaze me that people understand that and then don't think he can do what he wants to with you. And, and so we find then that uh, he did great and wonderful things, but the priest had to step out in the water. I asked you this morning, how long has it been since you stepped out into the water? How long has it been since you uh, had enough faith in God? And, and you know, some people say, well, that was a risky thing. No, no, if God's in, in control, there was no risk involved. It was being obedient and, and believing God's plan. You know what? Uh, because they were in pretty good shape then. I believe them priests were just... I don't know which way the river was running, but say it's coming from south like uh, Cross Creek does. I believe when they stepped in, they looked to, uh, to, to this way to see if it would start piling up yet. See, that's the difference between believing God and saying you do. Uh, and I'm afraid a lot of us in the modern day are more at the saying that we do instead of the doing and the reason why I don't see very much doing in the modern age, I really don't. <laughs> Verse 14, and on that day, the Lord magnified Joshua. So when you're obedient as a group, as a church, as a congregation, on that day, the Lord magnified Joshua. Your, your leader, your pastor will be magnified as well. On that day, the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Command the priests that bear the ark of the testimony to come down out of Jordan. And Joshua therefore commanded the priest, saying, Come ye up out of Jordan. Now what had happened in the middle is they had walked down there in Jordan, and they stood the whole time, the river just piling more and more up on this side of them, and everybody walked across, all the beasts walked across, and he gave them a little plan, and I, 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 I always amazed me. He said, out there in the middle, <laughs> Make you an offer with 12 stones. And when you're young and say, what meaneth this? You tell them what happened. Now, have you ever wondered how are the children even going to know that's down there to say, what's this mean? Well, see, the Jordan wasn't always in flood. It got down times, just like Carlisle Creek is on a normal day, about ankle deep, and you could run across it. See, and on those days, and that rock standing up real nice, say, there's where it happened. That's what he did for me. That's where I was delivered. And I saw the water stacking up. Now, you know the rest of the story. They went in on the other side, and they camped out a few days, and all the people there uh, uh, on, the, on the other side of Jordan the big walled city, they got nervous and they, they locked the doors and all they did was walk around it. And the last day they shouted. And remember, Joshua gave them this plan. Walk around it silent six days and on the seventh day, let out a shout, blow your bugles and the walls are going to come down. And that's exactly what he ended. They ran in and attacked Jericho took everybody. See, they had enough faith in God that they followed his plan completely. Maybe when it didn't even make sense. Killing the babies, killing the children, seems cruel to us. I don't understand it either, but I do know this it was God's plan. And they did. And then, the very Next time, they had trouble at Little Ai. See, isn't it easy when you're first saved to get out and follow God's plan? 
Just so thrilled that the Lord's made a new creature out of you, a new being, a new person. And then maybe a month later, you begin to get that hummy drum. Maybe you get a little bit excited about yourself. And he's got to bring you down. Now, have you ever thought about this? Where did that boy get the shekels of gold was it silver? And the goodly Babylonian garment, because he didn't get it at Ai. Because you know what? They were defeated at Ai, right? So he had to get it from Jericho. That's the only place he could have got it from. And see, in the, in, the, in the instance of success, he could not help but violate the Word of God. So when you get successful, you remember that little boy that lost his life for a goodly Babylonian garment. You know, God's people never have like the, the plan of garments that God has for them. They've always wanted something different. You know what? There was nothing good about a body. You know who was calling it a goodly Babylonian garment? A lost man. And yes, I certainly believe he was lost. And I'm, uh, I, I don't believe he, he was a follower of God in any way. And you know what? The Bible says he lost his life over it. And that he was stoned to death. And uh, that was all put behind them. And you know why? Because they dealt with the sin that was in the camp. Now, I want to read very quickly, and I'll try to be more brief, about a similar occurrence in the book of Exodus. Exodus 14. Uh, Moses leaving the land of bondage. Exodus 14. And verse 13, Exodus 14, and verse 13, the Bible says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. And he will show to you today, for the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. And the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Remember, just standing still sometimes is God's plan. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. And again, I want you to see that there had to be a movement toward God's will. But but lift up thy rod and stretch it over and stretch it and stretch out thy hand over the sea and divide it. And that the children of Israel go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptian, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, upon, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God went before the camp of Israel and moved around and went behind them and the pillar of the cloud went from before them, before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel and it was as a cloud of darkness to them. Now I want you to see that the cloud of the fire was usually kind of like a gray white look. But when it went around to the back side the Egyptians saw something black. See, every lost person sees God differently than you do. They see him as trouble. They, say, they see him as a menace. They see him as a difficulty. You know what? If atheists are so caught up that there is no God, won't they quit talking about him? They'd be like me going, nothing's nothing. Did you hear what I said? Nothing is nothing. 
You know, why waste your breath if that's what you believe? Leave me alone and I'll believe what I want to believe and you believe what you want to believe. But you know what the real thing is? It's not that they don't believe in God. They don't want to be accountable to God. Yeah. That, 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 that's the real issue. And, and so we find what they perceived as good, the heathen perceived as evil and blackness and darkness. And it, and it will always be that way until evil is set aside. And uh, reading on in uh, verse 19, And the angel of God went before the camp of Israel and removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their faces and stood behind them, and it came, uh, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of the Israels, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to those, so that they came not, they came, that the one came not near other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all the night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Now, I want you to see a little bit of difference in the miracles that the problem's divided and not heaped up. See, God solves problems in different ways, does he not? He solves difficulties. See, it don't seem like a big thing to cross a river until it's flooded, does it? If you want to go down to the Little Cross Creeks at Carlisle, right now, I can get you across in about that deep. But what about when, when water's like this in the store? I can only imagine when it's in that creek bottom. Because see, the creek bottom goes like this before, before you get down to the, the just walking in the shower. So that's full. The banks are full. And now you've got eight feet or uh, six feet in the store. You know what you would happen to me? You would drown. So they need an answer to that problem of grounding, and God heaped it up. The Israelites in Moses' day needed an answer of deliverance, and he provided by piling it up on both sides. He'll give us a way. He'll, he'll make a way for you every time. The thing, the thing to ask yourself is, do you have the faith? Do you have the faith to step out when water's up on both sides? Looking maybe back in there and seeing a whale and, and an octopus and all of them held back by the by the mighty hand of God. And they're just walking along, uh, going, going on to the promised land. But this is the difference. We, we know the little boy that took just a little something with him. I want you to see in Exodus chapter 16. The first verse, the Bible says, And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of sin. Now, I like the wording there, and I've never noted it, noticed it before, but see, sin should be a wilderness to us. We don't understand it. We don't know how to navigate it. We don't know where we're at. But if you, you ask yourself this morning, is sin a wilderness to you, or are you pretty handy with it? See, that was supposed to be a wilderness to them. Uh, down in the wilderness of sin, uh, should not even know what, uh, understand the situation and what will happen to you as it happened to them when you're in the wilderness of sin, you'll lose your faith. In, they came into the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, and on the 15th day of the second month, and I figured that up, that was two weeks out, after departing out of the land of Egypt, the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron and in the wilderness, and the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, then when we sat by flesh pots and we did eat bread unto the full, for ye have brought us forth into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Two weeks out. 
And I also want you to, to notice this. How many people were out of the will of God in Joshua's cross? One. Notice what that said. It said the whole congregation. Every one of them. In the murmur. Wished our, and see, they must not have remembered Israel too much. Talking about flesh pots and bread. And the Bible said they'd eaten leeks and garlics. Junk that nobody else would have. When we look back on sin, don't you remember it with <laughs> funness? Don't you remember it like, whoo, that was a good time? Because you know what you had back then, if you knew it or not, was a bunch of leeks and garlics. Just nasty stuff that nobody else would eat. So this morning, I would ask you, if you're saved, how much do you trust the Lord? Do you trust Him enough to do whatever? Do you trust Him enough to do what He asks you to do? Do you trust Him enough to, uh, to say, if that's your will, that's your will? You know, a few of us have been talking about Brother Mark and what a testimony he is. You think he ever thought in his mind, man, I'd sure love to have esophageal cancer? Of course not. That's foolish, ain't it? But that is what God planned for him. It's his Jordan cross. And you know what he did? He stepped out of the water. And you know what? We will, we will have to, too. And you know, it may not be the tragedy of cancer. It may be something as simple. You get out of your bed and you go knock on that woman's door and you bid her to the house of God. And you know what? For some people, that's just as difficult yeah. as dealing with cancer. Some, some, some for more, it's, it's worse. You shy and you're introverted. <laughs> it almost feels worse. So we need to serve him and we just need to follow God's plan for our lives. And we need to follow God's plan as a church. Because I, I want you to see it took more than one priest to get that ark down in the water. Takes very don't it? Are you where you want? Are you where he wants you to be this 